Welcome to our panel discussion on the opioid epidemic, its impact on our communities. My name is John Accardino, and I serve as the dean of the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public <coughs> Affairs here at VCU. I'm really delighted to see this room full today. This is such an important issue, and I appreciate your concern and your interest in this issue. The opioid epidemic has become the scourge of our times, outpacing many traditional illnesses as in, in its fatality rates. Its devastating effects, which began perhaps in many rural areas, including in low wealth Appalachia, have now spread across the country, from Appalachia to the Tony suburbs of, uh, of Charlotte, North Carolina, and L Los Angeles. The Richmond region hasn't been hit quite as badly as other parts of our Commonwealth, and certainly not as bad as other parts of our nation. But here, too, we have felt the effects of the opioid epidemic, and it is growing in its seriousness. Just last year, for example, in 2017, the city of Richmond experienced 356 reported overdoses, of which 43 were fatal. In Henrico County, the number was 222 reported overdoses, 42 of those fatal. In Hanover County, 58 overdoses, 10 fatal. And in Chesterfield County, 181 reported overdoses, 39 fatal. This year, under the leadership of University College Interim Dean Dr. Shelley Fowler, VCU chose as its common book, Dreamland, a detailed and riveting account of, uh, by Sam Quinones of how this pernicious epidemic works. If you have not yet read that book, please do so. Uh, it is a really excellent book that lays out in very good detail what our nation is suffering through. This morning, the Wilder School brings its expertise in public policy, community development, public safety, and public health to addressing this issue. The panel that we've put together for you today reflects our integrated academic approach to today's pressing <coughs> social issues and brings our expertise to the forefront. And it's very, very important to address issues like this opioid epidemic from the multidisciplinary lens that is necessary to understand it. Certainly, it is a law enforcement criminal justice problem. It's also a psychological problem. It's a family problem. It is an economic development problem, a jobs problem. It's an urban planning problem, a public administration problem. And above all, it is a public policy problem. If we are going to get around on this problem, we have to understand the fullness, the, the interdisciplinary aspects of this problem and figure out how to handle it. This is at the core of what we do in the Wilder School. We are an interdisciplinary school. We inform public policy through cutting edge research, community engagement, and we seek to prepare our students to be tomorrow's public policy leaders. We convene the community through important events such as this. And I'm so pleased today to be able to thank Dr. Amy Cook of the Wilder School for her leadership in organizing this event. I'm also very grateful to uh, Sheriff Carl Leonard by the way, an alumnus of our criminal justice program for participating today, as I am of John Ramsey, an editor at the Times-Dispatch who has written extensively on the opioid crisis. And I am very grateful to Dr. Kate Howell and Dr. Sarah Raskin of the Wilder School for their work and their contributions. And I am above all grateful to you for your interest and your concern with this issue. Uh, and with that, I believe, um, uh, without further ado, I'm now pleased to turn the program over to John Ramsey, our panel moderator. Thank you. I just had a brief introduction I wanted to share with you guys about uh, where we are today in, in Virginia with the, uh, the opioid crisis. Uh, you can see from this chart that uh, fatal drug overdose since 2013 has been the leading cause of unnatural death in Virginia. It kills more people than car crashes. It kills more people than guns. In the decade from 2017 to, or from 20, 2007 to 2016, more than 6,600 Virginians died from drug overdoses, primarily opiates. For 2017, that, that number is on the pace to be 
nearly 1,200 more people. Um, this didn't begin in 2017. That's just when the state started tracking it as a, an epidemic or as an emergency. But we've seen steadily more and more overdoses. But what began as a painkiller problem with doctors giving too many Percocets to people has become a heroin and fentanyl problem on top of that. Um, you can see that Southwest Virginia and really the population centers are, are what are being hit hardest by this. With just prescription opioids, we cut back on the number as a nation that we were giving out to people, and we got a handle on painkiller overdoses. We haven't been able to reduce them, but they're not, they're not rising as much anymore. But look at, look at the years where we decided we're not going to give out as many painkillers. It, it, was, it was the perfect storm of, of creating for years and years this market of addiction that, that heroin dealers have, uh, have found so lucrative. Heroin in Virginia is more just the population centers. Check. Good. We can, uh, we can see that, uh, that heroin, mostly in the cities, uh, fentanyl, which is, uh, it used to be mainly prescribed for extreme pain. Now it's manufactured illegally, sold as heroin pretty often. You're seeing it mostly in the population centers as well. Um, in the city, I did a report with a colleague of mine in October, and we found that just in Richmond, there were averaging 19 overdoses a week. Ambulance crews were on pace to treat 40% more overdoses than the previous year, and more than twice as many as 2015. I rode with ambulance crews to witness an overdose. The woman I saw was a doctor who'd been at Cabana, the rooftop bar in downtown, overdosed in the bathroom. She was one of 10 overdoses that weekend in the city. Some were on Midlothian Turnpike, some were in Church Hill. They were spread all over the city. People are dying in parking lots and alleys, alone in the bathroom and in front of their children. Last summer, there was a pregnant woman found overdosed behind Franklin Military Academy, five miles from here. It was too late for her and the unborn child, as it has been for more than a thousand others in Richmond and surrounding counties in the past decade. The Richmond region trails only Roanoke for the highest rate of ER visits for opioid, opioid overdoses in Virginia. The local rate is more than twice the state average. We've done a lot better at keeping people alive who overdose. This is a chart from the uh, Richmond Ambulance Authority on how many times they've used naloxone, a life-saving drug that reverses a, a heroin overdose or a, a painkiller overdose. And so on the one hand, we're doing a lot better at, at keeping people alive, but this combined with the rising death numbers shows us that addiction does have a grip on this community and just keeping people alive isn't good enough. A VCU doctor told me that the solution, the real solution beyond paramedics and doctors and naloxone and all that is treatment of addiction. And that's the thing people don't really talk about that they should. That's the real treatment. Narcan keeps them alive, but what's missing is access and funding for treatment. And so without the treatment, we're still seeing all these impacts to our community. The jails are overrun with people who are locked up for either possession of drugs or the crimes that they often commit to get possession of those drugs. Um, 
we're seeing record numbers of babies born addicted to uh, to heroin or painkillers. Um, the impacts are, are huge, and I hope what we can do today is discuss how we got here, what we can do to be better, and, uh, and, and where we go forward. And so I will, uh, I'll start with some questions, and I'm just going to sit down with you guys. So Kate, from your, from your perspective, how did we get here from the, the introduction of a miracle pill for pain just a couple decades ago into an epidemic that's destroyed so many lives? I think to really start thinking about that, I, I kind of go back to um, summer of 2001 for me. And I was working in central Appalachia doing some home repair work. And I was having a conversation with uh, a gentleman who worked at the hardware store. And I talked to the guys in the hardware store because we were buying materials. And he just kind of offhandedly was like, oh, I can get Oxy, Oxy anywhere. And I was like, Oxy, what is that? Um, I had no idea what it was at the time. Um, but uh, the next year, Dateline had this massive, really well-researched project on um, opioids in central Appalachia. And it was right around the area that I was working and it was right then and they were like, this is a crisis. And I was like, awesome, we're gonna really pay attention to this. That was 2002. Um, and I, I sort of think about this um, because now we are 16 years later um, and just now we're saying, oh, it's a crisis. Oh shoot, we should do something about that. And so I asked the question of sort of, okay, well, well, why are we still doing this? And I think about, I compared it a little bit to the foreclosure crisis. Um, and the foreclosure crisis wasn't a crisis until it suddenly hit people that, um, I guess I'm supposed to hold this closer, sorry y'all. Uh, it's uh, it, it wasn't a crisis for us until it hit places where people we couldn't throw away or ignore. Uh, it was it, Until it was hitting them, we really were like, oh well, you know, they made, they made bad choices. I mean, who borrows that much money? It must be their fault. Um, and then so suddenly it hits our suburban communities and suburban white communities particularly, and we say, oh, actually, this is a crisis. This is something that the loan lending industry did to us, or this is something else. And so I think that I see a lot of parallels between the way that we're looking at the opioid crisis and foreclosures, and the way that we sort of accepted certain communities and certain people, um, minorities in inner cities, uh, where heroin has been a problem for a very long time, and uh, low-income people in places like Central Appalachia, uh, where you know we've sort of happily ignored, and, and I'm not saying that I've happily ignored, but they they have been ignored as a community for a long time. And so, once it hit our our suburban communities, we suddenly realized, wait, this is a problem. And you hear news reports, and I talk. I'm kind of going off a little bit, I hope it's okay, but you hear news reports where suddenly they describe people, well, she was a cheerleader and she was beautiful and suddenly she's addicted to painkillers or heroin. And it, it sets up this dichotomy where all of a sudden people that we aren't expecting, right? We expect people, we, so we expect a certain kind of people to be addicted and that's, that's kind of what often has happened. Uh, and now that it's something different, we go, oh no, we gotta do something. Um, look, it's, it's, it's the football player, it's the star cheerleader, it's the really smart kid. Um, we can't accept that. And I think that kind of, the, the fact that we ignored it for so long allowed it to really grow exponentially because we decided not to treat when it was actually a smaller problem in smaller communities. Why do we care more about the, uh, the suburban teenager than the, uh, the ones who were being impacted either in uh, Appalachia or, or in the inner city? trying to figure out how to phrase this best, um, really. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that there's definitely, like I said, there are places that we think it's okay to ignore. We can say it's a personality problem, right? Well, what's wrong with those people who keep getting addicted? You know, heroin's for junkies, right? We think about that and we say, we, do we have in our mind exactly who is addicted to heroin? When you think about that and you make a decision, who is addicted to heroin, it is something wrong with them. Uh, but when it comes into places where we don't expect, and parents, you know, you hear about it all the time, of parents who are like, but I didn't think it would be my child. Um, well, no one thinks it's gonna be their child. Oh yeah, I, I knew I was gonna have the junkie kid, and so I just went along with that. Like, it doesn't happen, right? Um, so uh, I think that that's the biggest thing, is that um, there's sort of a classism and a racism that is really ingrained in um, how we do public policy and how we respond to public health emergencies. Okay. 
Sarah, let's uh, let's switch gears and, and look at a different angle. What were the factors swirling around the the medical and, and pharmaceutical industries that allowed these pills the, to take off to the point that uh, the U.S. uses more than 90 percent of the world's hydrocodone? That's such an important question, John. Um, so I think, first of all, we have to think about the context of medicine as a context of service, and that there are real benevolent motives in clinicians. They want to treat people, and historically that meant treating their um, symptoms. And in the um, late 20th century, there was this turn toward pain as a crucial symptom to be treated. And this was um, uh, a benevolent approach. And I think in particular in the regions where um, the uh, opioid epidemic began, there was an emphasis on treating the pain that was really a result of hard labor industries. So we're talking about mining, of course, and also we're talking about, um, you know, uh, about timber, about the production of timber. We're talking about the production of other natural resources. And then also the adjacent industries that move those resources around. So this is railroad, this is trucking. These are also industries that create tremendous burdens on bodies at young ages. You know, we're talking about, um, in particular, young men who are um, working very hard with their bodies, doing physical labor for long periods of time, who are then in pain. And so when the opportunity to treat that pain comes along in a convenient way, um, which is the form of a, of a, of a painkiller, um, that's very appealing to benevolent doctors who really want to, um, to help these patients. Um, at the same time, the research behind um, the development of, of um, pharmaceutical approaches to pain relief um, really was a miss in terms of the scientific community. So for those of you who have read um, Dreamland, Sam Kinos's book, you're familiar perhaps uh, with, the, um, with his observation that the notion that uh, oxycodone was non-addictive was based on a letter, not actual scientific research. So in the most prestigious medical journal in the United States, the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a letter, not, not a study that had the same burden of evidence that most other studies are expected to be subjected to, but a letter that said that oxycodone was not addictive, and not only was it a letter, so it was an opinion, not empirical, it was based on cases with terminal patients. And so, of course, there's no addiction when, to be blunt, someone is going to die. They are going to die before addiction sets in. But this letter was girded, and I, I will betray my perspective right now, it was, it was girded by an industry that has a profit motive around scientific development. The profit motive of the pharmaceutical industry is often thought of as advancing competition in a favorable way to produce innovative drugs, and that is accurate. And it is also accurate that it can be, excuse my language, but bastardized into a situation where there's a strong incentive to, um, to manipulate evidence and hide evidence or not even pursue evidence of the addictive properties of these drugs. So that's really kind of the backdrop. Um, there was also an extraordinarily aggressive marketing campaign by the pharmaceutical industry to these regions where these drugs um, uh, you know, where they knew that they would be um, strong markets. So I think I'll leave my remarks there, um, at least for now. Sure, and just, just one follow-up I have is, okay, we had this big push, and, and of course doctors are acting benevolently, and, and they're being told that the science is these pills are not addictive, but they had to see these patients coming back month after month. The signs had to be there. Why didn't we sniff this out as too good to be true a lot sooner? Um, that's an extraordinarily insightful question. Um, and I think, I think part of it goes back to this idea that there's 
evidence capital E, right? There's randomized clinical trials. There are large studies. There are data from, you know, large cohorts over time. But then there's also the data point of personal experience. And as an anthropologist, I'm particularly um, oriented toward the evidence of narrative, toward, toward, narr toward one's personal experience as a, a rationale, frankly, for explaining a problem. And so for an individual doctor to then look at their patient and say, we have this technology that has been um, helping reduce your pain over time. You're telling me you continue to have this pain, but I'm gonna deny it to you because from my subjective stance, um, I, I feel that it's time to move on. Um, I, I don't know how many folks are clinicians in this room. I'm certainly not, but I can't imagine saying that to someone. And I think also um, there is a drive in, in medicine in corporate medicine, which is how medicine is practiced in the United States, that you know that you have to retain patients in order to keep a viable practice, whether that's an individual private practitioner or a healthcare system or, or ho individual hospital. And so um, there was certainly an awareness among patients that if one doctor wasn't gonna prescribe, another would. And so certainly there is concern, there was concern about losing patients. Um, and so I think that, that, that there were both of these things going on right then. And then the third thing that I do wanna mention is that even as addiction was um, being <coughs> recognized among, let's say for example, general practitioners, um, beginning to be recognized the um, the pain specialist uh, specialization was also emerging, and that included um, people who wanted to take multimodal approaches to pain management, like at University of Washington, that involved you know physical therapy and uh, psychosocial approaches that might have um, also treated some of the psychosocial background to some of the pain experience. Um, at the same time, there were bad actors who were developing you know there were there were felons who were developing pain clinics. So I also work in Southwest Virginia, and um, you know, if you if you drive down, you know, around Lebanon, for example, there are just these pain clinics there that have lines of people out the door who are aware that they can go in, have a pseudo test, um, and and that a licensed practitioner who might have been a felon or might have been motivated by profit or whatever, um, was prescribing them new approaches to pain management, um, such as Suboxone, that can also be abused. Right, so the, the patients and the money flow to wherever, wherever the doctor will still give the pills. Sheriff Leonard, I've I've been in your jail before to uh, to to talk to some yeah, of the people who were in your uh, <laughs> right who were in your program. Um, yes, and you know I hear all the time we can't arrest our way out of this, but I've spoken to parents who've called the law on their own son or daughter because it seems the only place people are getting treatment is inside a jail. Why is that? And how do you approach addiction in your facility? So uh, this has been a big change in my life uh, culturally. I've been in law enforcement for 37 years. Uh, started it in 81, served all through the 80s when cocaine was the drug of choice. 90s it was crack, you know, 2000s synthetics. And then we hit uh, now when we have this heroin. Uh, in 37 years, never saw any drug uh, as plentiful as inexpensive and as harming uh, as heroin and opioid have seen. So uh, I've changed my approach and uh, what I say now is arrest them all. Frankly, arrest them all. Because uh, we have to arrest our way out of this because those resources simply aren't available in the community for them to go to to get the help they need. At least affordable and accessible help for addiction isn't available in most of our communities. If you have $50,000 and want to go to a recovery house, you can get there. But for the majority of the folks that we deal with, they don't have the funds, the insurance, the capital to get to these resource centers. So I do believe we have to arrest our way out of it, bring them into jail, and get them in a program. But that's the difference. Uh, it, jails have operated for 200 years, and we failed epically in treating addictions. Very good places to get you sober, will get you clean, 
But what we've done is actually been part of the problem. We send you out of jail as a sober addict. You're still an addict. You came into my jail, you might have had a two gram a day heroin habit. When you get out and you're clean, your mind says, I'm a two gram a day guy. You go get that first hit of two grams of cocaine, or sorry, of heroin, you're dead. Because your body doesn't need it anymore. So we were actually contributing to the problem. So the switch here is, yes, bring him to jail. Let's get him into a recovery program. And let's start releasing sober recovered addicts as opposed to just sober addicts. Uh, it's not easy. Recovery is attainable, but it's not easy. It's a lot that goes into this program uh, to work on it. Heroin is different than a lot of other drugs. You have the normal pathway of peer pressure, progression from alcohol, even cigarettes, to marijuana, to cocaine, to, to heroin. Uh, you also have the pain, uh, uh, overprescription of painkillers as a progression. But one of the biggest ones we're finding is that trauma-initiated addiction. Uh, those folks that experience traumatic events in their life, and some of these are very traumatic, and we won't go into it, that creates such a void or a pain in your life that the only thing you got to cope with that is using heroin or opioids. So there's, there's four, at least four different pathways into this, and we try to deal with whatever that pathway was for you to give you the, the training and tools to cope with that void or pain in your life. So you can start addressing it now through tools in your personal toolbox and not through further use of opioids. Our program is also very unique in that our jail doors are open every day for any addict in the community to come in off the street and get recovery help. You don't have to be arrested, and we do let you go at the end of the day. Uh, we've also had people spend the night in our jail because they felt they were at the end and were going to use, and that next time most likely will be the last time. So. In essence, what we're running is a community-based recovery program out of our jail simply because they're not available in most communities where they're accessible and affordable. And, and mind you, when an addict says, I want to stop, I need help, the time to get them help has to be that very minute. You can't say, come back a week from Tuesday, it's too late. It has to be immediate, it has to be right then, and that's just not available. And that's why I say now, we have to arrest our way out of it. Get them into these uh, jails. Henrico's got great programs. Richmond's got great programs. Uh, and, and get them the treatment they need for the addiction. Uh, that is a disease. We know that now. And we got to get them the help to deal with that disease. So when they do get out of jail, they're now recovered addicts without the need to get the next use. Right. As an example, people who go to the Richmond Community Services Board who say, I want to stop. Can you help me now? I think it's weeks, if not months, that they have to wait to get into actual treatment. Um, one of the things you mentioned was trauma. And when we talk about treating addiction, oftentimes we don't also talk about the, the factors that maybe created the addiction. Can you tell us a little bit what you see in the addicted population in your facility as far as the overlap between whether it's trauma or mental health issues and addiction? Trauma is a big uh, reason for a lot of the addictions we're seeing in our, in our population. Uh, traumas can be as easy as, uh, as somebody experience a loss of a family member at an early age uh, to very stressful stuff. Uh, you know, I have a young lady in my facility who on a weekend was tied to a workbench in a garage and over the course of the weekend, sexually abused by 10 people. She turned to heroin. Do you blame her? But that heroin use is to cover that pain in her life. And these stories, I can go on all night long, and I, and I won't. But you need to understand that people don't go to heroin. First of all, nobody's ever said, I want to be an addict. Nobody's ever said in their life, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, marijuana, nobody's ever said, I want to be an addict. Some people have gone voluntarily into drug use, but in these cases, when the trauma initiates it, it's to cover that pain. All of that ties in with mental illness because it does affect you mentally. Uh, there is a, a, a huge nexus between mental illness and addiction. We do address that. We, we have a very good relationship in our county. I saw Dr. Casey come into the room, our county administrator. Uh, we work closely with our, our community service board, our mental health. 
Last year, the county allowed me to hire a psychiatrist and two mental health clinicians to work in our jail just to address the mental illness aspect of addiction because it is hand in hand. But that's also one of the problems with uh, jails, or not with jails, but with the process. Uh, when they get out of my jail, those services stop. And that's what we need to do is have that continuity of services. And one of our clinicians strictly works on doing that handoff. When you get ready to leave our jail, you will have that first appointment with your next mental health uh, specialist. Uh, we have uh, our doctor, medical doctor from our jails here, Dr. Gay. We let you leave our jail with at least a 30-day supply of whatever prescription medicines you're on. Because if you just simply stop those meds the day you get out of jail, you're going to spiral back into where you started. So a lot of that continuation of services works hand-in-hand -hand with mental health within the jail and then post-release is really where the most critical point is of capturing that mental health nexus. Thank you. Amy, you're going to talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the Wilder School's public safety poll. And we just heard Sheriff Leonard say, arrest them all. Because of his uh, on-the-ground experience, arrest them all. The public safety poll says, overwhelmingly, people support treatment over arrest. How's that different from previous years? And how do you, how do you square that with, with Sheriff Leonard's real world experience of many of the only people who are getting help are getting it after being arrested? I'm not going to argue with Sheriff Leonard, okay? We'll save that for another day. But um, I do think it's important to just talk about sort of some perspectives on what treatment um, means to Americans. Um, first of all, Americans do acknowledge that this is a crisis that we're in right now with respect to heroin and prescription pills. Um, about half of the people who have participated in these polls have also known someone addicted to prescription pills. So it's it's, it's prevalent, right? Um, in terms of how that relates to uh, the Wilder School's um, results, it's a survey that we do annually, and we do different issues every year. And our Office of Public Policy Outreach is um, working closely with um, our uh, secretaries of uh, public safety and homeland security, as well as um, mental health services. And so we asked the public 2016-2017 uh, whether they thought treatment was a better approach than arresting. And so, unlike my friend here, um, overwhelmingly Virginians said, well, we would rather offer treatment. Um, and I think that um, part of that could be, you know, it's sort of one or the other. Um, when we then 2017, 2018 asked more specifically, well, what does treatment look like? Um, we put in three um, specific uh, aspects of treatment. One is the expansion of community-based services, which the public overwhelmingly supported. Over 85% of Virginians said, yes, we want the expansion of services. Um, we looked at housing, so recovery housing, which is a major problem for people who leave not only jails, but um, their own situations. Um, and again, overwhelming support for housing. And here was the interesting part about that. We use the phrase in your own community. And people wanted that expansion of services. We then followed up with another question about needle exchange programs, which do you want me to save till later? Uh, go ahead. OK. Um, so, and I think we'll come back to this in a little bit because I know Dr. Raskins actually has some things to add to what I'll say, but um, we don't see as much support for needle exchange programs, and I think that um, there are a few reasons for that. Um, one is the name alone just implies that you're given a needle to an addict. That's kind of what the name implies. Um, but when you learn about what needle exchange programs do, they have a much larger scope. Um, 
One of the things that they do is they protect um, something near and dear to my heart, which is law enforcement. Um, they protect uh, officers against uh, needle uh, sticks. Um, another important thing that they do is they reduce the transmission, the spread of HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, as well as other blood-borne illnesses. But most importantly, I mean, those things are we, we need those to happen. But I think most importantly is needle exchange programs offer an avenue to treatment. And that's the part that we seem to not be as educated on, that uh, needle exchange programs just don't blindly hand out single-use needles to folks. Um, they offer a provision of services there. And many times these services would never be accessible to these populations um, short of being a part of those needle exchange programs. And so they can provide those wraparound services that we need for these populations that are uh, intravenous drug users. And so I'll just, you asked me a second question, which was? Well, I, I wanted to know about needle exchanges as well, because Virginia just passed a law. They're legal in Virginia, but none exist. There's this caveat in the law that you need community support. So first of all, um, in 2017, the General Assembly did legalize needle exchange progr uh, programs in Virginia, and um, there are currently 55 jurisdictions across the state that have been um, deemed at risk, um, which means that if they had a group apply for license to run the programs in Virginia, that they would essentially be approved if they met certain protocols and criteria. Um, the Virginia Department of Health is responsible for that, and their website has a lot of good information if you want information about how that would work. Um, so from there, the locality, as well as law enforcement, as well as the local um, health district, as well as a number of other stakeholders, have to be supportive of the initiative. Um, and so getting all of those players together at the same table with high levels of support, um, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. I know that there are conversations around the state about those same issues. Um, so I think that that's good news. And let me also add um, a critical piece to these needle exchange programs is that there is no research out there that suggests that they endorse or increase IV drug use. And we are conditioned to think, and, and so Kate used the analogy of she, you know, compared this to the foreclosure. I sort of think about these needle exchange programs uh, like we had these conversations of sex ed. And, um, and so abstinence doesn't get us anywhere. And one of the things that a needle exchange program does is it recognizes a comprehensive um, public health approach, a harm reduction approach that realizes that the cycle of addiction is, um, you know, not just a choice that we make, but it involves biology, sociology, um, there's a spiritual piece to it. I mean, it's so multifaceted that um, it works to bring those services to people who are then ready. Um, and so I think that when we look at it from that approach, right, which what we're really missing here is education um, versus, in my opinion, just willful opposition to something that could help people. Sure, and underneath all that is that uh, we're already having a problem in Virginia with dirty needles uh, around Roanoke. You're seeing spikes in hepatitis C, and when you see a spike in hep C, often what you next see is a spike in HIV, right? And they do go hand in hand, and let me be clear, I'm not a medical doctor, um, but, right, um, I've, I've read the research, and obviously when we're thinking about IV drug use, that is the number one concern is that hepatitis C leads then to HIV. When you look at those statistics of people who are incarcerated, and I don't want to give Sheriff Leonard's thunder away here, but, I mean, he'll talk about that, that 
jails are spending a lot of money on treating HIV, um, as well as increased rates of hepatitis C. So, yeah, there's a lot of money that goes into that. And I um, will also acknowledge that some of these poll results that I've talked about do uh, sway in terms of uh, how voters see themselves aligned politically, um, but still, even so, Republicans um, in high numbers support this notion of treatment over arrest. Yeah. Sure. I think what's interesting about that, and I think it fits in with the needle exchange question um, in this whole conversation, um, and this is from my planner hat here, um, but this idea of what it means to be in your community, I think it's different to say, well, I want something in Chesterfield County. If that's your community, that's different than saying, I'd like it in, you know, adjacent to my subdivision. Um, and I think that the, the role of NIMBYs, right, not in my backyard, people who would say, I don't want that here, it's not in my backyard, we can deal with it in somewhere else. There's a strip mall down the street. Um, and, and I think that that's an interesting question with all of this, because people say they want treatment until, if they want it in their community until it's actually in their neighborhood, and then they stand up at the planning meeting and say, absolutely not. And I think that the needle exchange piece, that was pretty much a loophole that you could put in. You could say, sure, we support needle exchange at the state level. Yeah, sure, it's great. Um, but yeah, if, if the community doesn't support it, then you can't have it. Well, very few people are, I mean, history tells us, right, of, of, this, of this addiction, of this issue, that people don't voluntarily say, I want the needle exchange here. I'd like the methadone clinic next to my house. I'd like the, paint, the pill mill next to my house, right? All of these things are sort of always away from services, often away from transit, away from places that, um, have, a, that have a richness of anything else other than the clinic itself or the needle exchange itself, which I think leaves it open to um, kind of additional issues. So uh, just the needle exchange program, <clears throat> it's very sensitive. And I will say that Chesterfield County, I believe, is the uh, Chesterfield County Sheriff's Office is the only one who's started the application process, and we're moving forward with it. Uh, but here's the reason. It is a harm reduction tool. Uh, I don't want to do a needle exchange program, and I don't want to have a recovery center in my jail. But the fact of the matter is there aren't recovery centers in our community, so I have to have it. Uh, the fact of the matter is overdoses and deaths in Chessville have gone up every year for the last four years. So if we're not seeing this problem even start to taper off, I'm not even saying start going down, just taper off, if it's going to continue to go up, which it is, uh, we have to do the most we can to reduce all that harm. Uh, in my jail, the odds are you got hep C if you're a user. Odds are, by far that you're gonna have hep C. I will tell you the cost of uh, HIV medicine now has gone up, because we're seeing that. And these are long-term results of using dirty needles. Uh, so we're gonna try to implement this program to kind of reduce some of the harm being done on top of the addiction itself. Again, it's not something we wanna venture down, but we're not seeing this, this epidemic even start to slow down. So we've gotta do something more uh, but I will tell you, not in my backyard. When we first announced we were going to explore this, not even go down this path, uh, the responses I got were immensely uh, unpopular against me and our decision to do this. Uh, everybody's for it, like you say, except in my backyard. I think still because there's reluctance to admit that we have a problem, first of all, and we do. Let, let's not fool ourselves anymore. Uh, and it's happening, it's happening to our neighbors, our coworkers, people we're in church with, and our families. I often tell everybody in these audiences I go to is everybody in here knows a heroin addict. You all do. You may not know you do, but you do because they're everywhere. Uh, this problem has just permeated our community and they're everywhere. And if we don't start doing some of this harm reduction, I'm afraid of what's gonna happen 10, 20 years down the road when all of these hep C and, and HIV uh, things just continue to perpetuate. So we are looking at it in Chesterfield County. It's not popular, as you say, within the community. It is statewide. Can I make, <clears throat> I'd like to make one more comment yeah. um, about uh, harm reduction approaches related to needle exchanges. 
Um, so I've actually volunteered on a needle exchange in Atlanta in the early 2000s. Um, so I was one of the volunteers who was out on the van, out in the community, um, uh, receiving um, used needles into a sharps container and providing not only clean needles and clean water, because that's also important, but also food and clothing and menstrual management products for women and just human connection. And I think about what Sheriff Leonard mentioned about trauma. And certainly these services are not therapeutic in the psychological sort of way to give someone who is living with addiction these, these basic human components of dignity. But I do think that there is also a, a kindness factor of, of the variety of interactions that can be had in a needle exchange that are not just about disease reduction, of course that's critically important, but they also are about providing dignity to people who are living with addiction who are often some of the most vilified members of our society. And I'd also like to say that there are two other things really briefly that I want to touch on. One is um, Amy mentioned the importance of protecting officers from needle sticks, but it extends beyond that in terms of public safety. I'm a mother. I think many of us in this room are parents. And the opportunity to reduce public exposure among our children, our peers, our elders to accidental needle sticks that are disposed in public places is a crucial public safety and public health opportunity here that I think extends beyond people who are living in active addiction. So that's one kind of pitch that I want to make. And another really has to do with women. You know, we talk about the spread of HIV and, and hepatitis vis-a-vis -vis sharing needles, but also in these epidemics, they also share via sex as a vehicle for exchange. So, you know, pills for sex. And the opportunities in needle exchange, not only to provide condoms, for example, but frankly to provide safe places, in particular for women and often queer men or queer identifying men or trans men to also have a safe place to be where they can get what they need in order to inject safely also reduces their vulnerability not only to HIV and hepatitis through the exchange of sex, but also the violence actually that can be enacted against them as a result of having to put themselves in unsafe settings where they might be sexually assaulted in order to obtain um, the, the substances to which they're addicted. So I just wanna add those comments. Sure, we were just talking about needle exchanges and, and intravenous use, and of course, in the city, that's that's probably a bigger deal today than than the painkillers. But I do want to go back to this question uh, that that began in doctors' offices: Are we still over prescribing painkillers or opiate replacement drugs? I think that question is for me, <laughs> at least as one observer in clinical settings. Um, I don't know that I can answer that question yes or no. What I can tell you is that pain as a concept has moved from a quality of life issue to be managed to a issue that we see as something that we have a mandate to eradicate. And that's a particularly modern convention. And so, again, it is hard to look at someone who is suffering pain, either physical pain or the pain of trauma, the psychological pain, that can result in, um, in just truly experiencing embodied pain that starts psychologically. There is little incentive to manage it other ways. So, for example, how insurance reimburses services delivered it can be really hard to get reimbursements for things like physical therapy or psychotherapy beyond a certain number of visits or for complementary and alternative treatments that have been demonstrated to be useful for pain such as acupuncture or neurofeedback. 
So there's not necessarily an adequate incentive on the business side of medicine to help drive our, our attention from prescribing to a more comprehensive approach. And at the same time, we see pharmaceutical companies create new formularies that they claim are non-addictive, but it remains to be seen if those new non-addictive formularies might not simply drive new opportunities for heroin and fentanyl within um, a new regulatory environment. Now, the regulatory environment in terms of um, monitoring, prescription monitoring programs, certainly um, can help to reduce the legal distribution of, of medications through prescribing. But as, as we're just discussing, they can't necessarily um, eradicate the uh, illicit trade at all. And in fact, they create new markets. Right, and Virginia has a prescription monitoring program, but how well does it work? How often are doctors actually checking it? You know, really, I think the frontline staff here are the pharmacists. I've heard some amazing work by pharmacists, including um, under threat of, of people who are addicted and are, and are really craving or needing to fix their addiction, um, who, who are making terrible threats against them. So I think that um, really one of the front lines here, and it, uh, it would be worthwhile to, to pursue this some more, is really pharmacists. We have made some strides. General Assembly started to address this last year in legislation. Uh, and so there are these reporting requirements, but they're not mandatory, which is one of the problems. Uh, so as far as doctors overprescribing, uh, I think with the awareness level, that's starting to taper off. But where we're seeing the biggest gains is with pharmacies themselves and pharmacists now paying more attention to it uh, and seeing, you know, and I've heard stories of pharmacists saying, well, no, I'm only going to give you 10, come back in a week. So that's where we're starting to see the gains. There is a lot more work to be made, though. And I think it's it's worth noting here um, that this the advertisements around pharmaceuticals, we, this is not normal across the world. Most places don't say, tell your doctor about blah, 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 um, because the doctors are the ones who should know these things. Um, and so I think that that's an important piece of this whole thing, is that there's been such a push in advertising around pharmaceuticals um, that doesn't happen in the rest of the world, um, particularly not the rest of the developed world. And so that has made it so that not only um, do you think, wow, I shouldn't be in pain, but no, I have the right to not be in pain, and look, there's a pill for it. Um, so even if doctors are doing less prescribing, I think there's still that push for a silver bullet. We love silver bullets in this country, something something quick and easy, and it gets fixed, and we've managed it. And um, and I think that, like I said, you know, I compare it to the foreclosure crisis because we were looking for that too. We say, well, home ownership. If you if you own a house, then you can have the American dream. You can live the way that you want to live. And we pushed it in the same way that I think we pushed um, pain management um, and pain eradication. Speaking of a silver bullet in Southwest Virginia. Suboxone was, was pushed there as a silver bullet. Suboxone is a drug that uh, gives an, ad, an addict a little bit of the opiate that they need to not go through withdrawal, but it has some uh, naloxone in it to prevent overdose. So overdoses on this drug are almost non-existent, but it was being pushed as, as a way to, to bring people out of addiction. And what we've seen is the streets are awash in Suboxone in Southwest Virginia now. The uh, the DAs, the the cops on the streets say it's the number one drug down there. So we always have to be watching out for those unintended consequences. Um, I wanted to hear what you guys think about how we're doing as a state addressing this crisis. I, I, I know we we now support treatment, but. But is treatment available? What do we do to get to a point where maybe the chart shows fewer deaths one year than the, than the previous year? Um, what do you guys see as solutions? They're looking at me. So before um, I, I talk about sort of accessibility. I think it's important to look at what treatment should really look like. I mean, we are sort of conditioned with this notion of addiction. Well, you went to a program, and then you came out and you used again. 
So, of course, treatment is a failure, right? I mean, in the criminal justice literature back in the 70s, there was this notion that rehabilitation just didn't work. Um, and, and that's really not true. Rehabilitation can work. Um, but here's some things that we need to know. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. It has to be a systems approach. It has to be an approach that's probably different for each addict. Um, because there's different factors that play into why people are using. We can't treat prescription pill addiction the same way that we treat heroin addiction necessarily. Um, because those pathways probably look different for people. Um, with that also means that we're looking at, um, you know, a variety of treatment approaches. Biological, I mean, I think we've really underestimated the role of biology across the board and what addiction is, and we've really looked at it as a moral failing. The bad choices, you've, you know, you chose to go hang out with that group and they're nothing but a bunch of addicts and birds of a feather flock together kind of thing. Um, and, and by not understanding the role of biology, we've not been able to really um, work toward uh, a, a good solution necessarily, because the truth of the matter is, is that biology is really important. It's not the only part, um, but we need to have a combination of therapy. So community-based, uh, dealing with social issues, uh, psychological issues, the biological issues, the trauma impact that it's had on users. Um, and, and the key part is that you have to be able to address it all and monitor it all. And so when it's not monitored, that's sort of how we drop the ball. And that creates an opportunity for users to then go out and continue because they don't have the support system that they need. So I think one of the things that um, Sheriff Leonard was talking about is, um, you know, a release plan. And with his addicts, he, um, with the folks in his program. He has a reentry coordinator and other folks that are working on um, exit plans. And where are you going when you leave here? You've got to follow up appointment with your doctor. We're going to have a you know, a, a meeting with employers, um, whatever it is, right? It has to be comprehensive, multi-pronged, and it has to be individualized. We cannot continue what we're doing and suggesting that there's a one-size-fits-all program with people. Um, and we have done that for a really long time. And if you look at the nature of addiction, the truth of the matter is, is that most people relapse. And that's because we haven't been very good at those wraparound comprehensive services. So what I think really needs to change is maybe we'll get to the point that we don't have to arrest everyone because it'll be more than the criminal justice system kind of coming through for us. So what I'd like to see is that there is treatment available for people who are in the community before they come in contact with police before they have to go through drug court, before, before they have to do all those other things. Because right now, the, critical, the criminal justice system is a critical piece um, for this issue, whether you think it should be or shouldn't be. I mean, that's another conversation, but it is a critical piece. Um, so I just thought that those were some things that we needed to talk about, um, because treatment, I feel like we just are like, well, it doesn't ever work. But there's a lot of people who've worked through recovery, and recovery is something that if you're an addict, you live with for the rest of your life, and it's everyday work. Um, what else was I supposed to say? Or answer? I, I was just so asking how we're actually doing. You asked, doing. as a state, how are we doing? We're failing. And look at this graph behind you, and that's the number one failure. Naloxone does not save lives. Naloxone postpones deaths, and that's all it's doing. Our hospitals are failing us when an addict who overdoses has to be rushed to the ER, have to be administered naloxone to be brought back to life, and then in 30 minutes is back on the street. Their number one goal is to get another hit of heroin because you just robbed them of the heroin that was in their system. 
So they go out and they know they have naloxone in their system, so they score more heroin. And what do they do? They overdose and they go back to the ER. They get hit with naloxone again, they're revived, they go back out on the street and they get another. Now I'm not making this up, I have addicts who've been to the hospital twice and three times in the same night from overdoses, each time being revived by naloxone. Hospitals need to revive you, yes, but then they need to say, but let's treat the underlying problem and that's the addiction. The overdose is a symptom. If you break your arm and go to a hospital and you're in excruciating pain, you're gonna get morphine for the pain. When that pain goes away, they don't put you on the sidewalk in 30 minutes. They're gonna fix the broken arm. All these addicts who are getting narc naloxone, being revived, aren't getting any treatment for the underlying issue. Uh, we need to start addressing the addiction immediately in the ERs uh, by providing resources, avenues to go, instead of going right back to get that next, next hit. I think the other place we're failing is within schools. I've met with several superintendents of three different districts and said, you have glee clubs, drama clubs, how about a recovery club? And you think uh, I said something that was out of this world when I get the looks back. I am a VCU alumni, and I'm very proud of Rams and Recovery. I think that's a great program this university has. But it's too late. It needs to be in middle schools, it needs to be in high schools. So earlier you were talking about whose problem this is. This is a community problem. Law enforcement, government can't fix this. It's schools, it's hospitals, it's everybody coming together. We need to have more programs in schools. We need to have hospitals treat the underlying addiction uh, we need everybody to understand this is all in for all of us. And, and it just, it, when I see charts like this and everybody's saying, oh, naloxone, we're good. Uh, we're not good. We're postponing deaths till the next time. And we've got to look at the underlying addiction. So one of the things that um, I thought of earlier that I thought it was just worth mentioning when we look at this notion of treatment and you mentioned uh, Suboxone um, and there's also Methadone. Um, in interviews with folks uh, that have been in uh, Sheriff Leonard's program, um, many of them have shared with us, you know, when I was on that, I was still getting high. I would sell that. It didn't matter, anything I could do to get high. So I think Kate mentioned something really important that we continue to look for like a solution. And we want the answer right now. And the answer isn't any in one of these single approaches, right? It's really, um, it's so much more complex. It's gonna be really expensive. But if we keep just putting people through the criminal justice system without these uh, more primary type prevention services, um, then we are creating a budgetary nightmare. And another thing that's really important too, for every dollar that's invested um, from a prevention perspective, yields anywhere, the numbers are about 350 um, to $7 per dollar invested. Um, that's, you know, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty incredible returns that we can get when we think about what primary prevention looks like. Um, I think that one of the things that I, that I think about a lot about this is that we have to stop being surprised by addiction. We all kind of go, oh my God, I just didn't know there's so many people addicted. Well, addiction is not new. Whether it is a functional alcoholic in your family or in your community, uh, a coke habit that you could kind of cover up and go to parties and it's cool, or other kinds of addictions, this is not something that just kind of fell out of the sky. Addiction is not new. What is new is a drug, the drugs that are more powerful than they were in the past and more, more affordable and so therefore more available and easier to get in general. So, I mean, I think that that's, that's the thing that I, I often think about it. Why are we surprised? There's no one who doesn't know someone who, or who has an addiction of some sort. And so that it is heroin makes it a particular kind of addiction but we need to actually be looking forward and thinking about addiction and not just go, ah, oh, drug, let's fix that. 
um, and, and really be more focused on a broader, again, I think public health approach or proactive approach to understanding addiction. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think when we, I'm speaking from more of a criminal justice perspective here, but we sort of follow trends and patterns about dr what drugs are being used and we respond accordingly. Um, but somehow it would be really great if we could sort of start forecasting the change sooner rather than chasing that. Um, and so I was reading uh, not too long ago um, that some of these overdose deaths, um, they aren't actually from heroin at all because there's no heroin in them. Right, they're just straight up fentanyl or straight up other drugs. And so I'm not sure that we're really prepared for that, right, because we're so focused on prescription pills and then the pathway to use heroin because it's cheaper and um, more accessible. So I think that that's important that it, when you look at something from a particular drug, it, it does look very different than looking at just addiction in general because um, Tide Pods, right, I mean, <laughs> P P people, right? P people are going to do all sorts of things, and so that prevention piece in elementary schools, in uh, middle schools, in uh, you know religious facilities, in communities, it just has to be a bigger part of um, of our culture because these are people that you know we have continued to see marginalized. All right, I've got several more questions, but I want to make sure we leave room for uh, for your questions out there. So let's uh, let's go ahead and take some questions from the uh, from the crowd. There's, Just step up to the mic. The <laughs> Hello. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, my question is towards uh, Sheriff Leonard. Uh, your arrest them, when you said arrest them all, and I, I know you're talking about just bringing them to jail so they can get clean, but when you actually have to go in to arrest them, aren't you just sobering up felons, releasing them back to the community as a, fel as a felon, making it harder for them to get a job and return to normal society? And wouldn't that lead towards more crime and more drug use? Absolutely. I mean, it, the heroin, a user, an addict, any addict, even an alcoholic, there's a stigma that goes with that. Uh, certainly there's a stigma with being a convicted criminal. As I said, I don't want this program in my jail. What I'm saying is there is no other programs for them to get the help they need. So instead of continuing out there on the, on the direction they're going and dying, arrest them and bring them in. At least they're going to be alive. Uh, but I, I don't want this program. I want there to be programs in the community that somebody can walk up to 24 hours a day and say, I'm an addict, I need help, and not be told, as, as John said earlier, come back a week from Thursday when we get you an appointment. Uh, that's my frustration. You're absolutely right. It is an additional stigma. But in the absence of running programs in jail, where are they going to get the help? It's just not there. It's got to be accessible, and it's got to be affordable, and we're losing. Thank you. So, yes. I I'd also like to respond that I think this is a question, uh, a great question that points out the importance of a comprehensive approach. Um, a couple, a little while ago, Amy um, drew on the analogy of comprehensive sex education, and I couldn't agree more. I think it requires getting outside of our comfort zones as parents, as employers. What does that mean to be an employer who would be willing to employ someone who has a criminal record? You know, what would it mean to um, to uh, expand um, needle exchange and, and housing needs to have something like a wet facility where there are supervised, doctor monitored, um, very cautious injecting opportunities for people who are living in addiction, such as the experiment that's about to take place in Philadelphia soon. So I think I completely agree with you that the importance of this comprehensive um, approach is getting outside of our comfort zone across a variety of sectors. I mean, uh, as we've talked about, there's stigma associated with this particular 
drug, but it's and 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 with injecting as a modality, um, and yet we don't have a similar stigma associated with, for example, the use of alcohol or you know cocaine among executives who can hide it, or increasingly with marijuana in states where it's legalized. And so I think that part of the comprehensive approach is really um, destigmatizing addiction in all its forms and 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 putting our money where our mouth is as employers, as parents, as um, as homeowners who rent out um, parts of our homes as well. I agree with you. And yeah. just remember, you can come into my jail without being arrested. We do have an open door policy because uh, we're trying to stop everybody from getting arrested. If you just need help, come on in. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, I, I will say, too, um, one of the, I think, the interesting uh, approaches to this in, in housing has been the housing first approach which creates sort of, instead of saying, um, in order to get, as if you're homeless and you need to get housing, uh, you have, like some places will say, you have to be totally clean and there's no alcohol and there's all these sorts of things and you have to have your life together before you get into this housing. But the housing first approach says, look, you know, you can't get your life together unless if you have stable housing. And I think that might be an interesting model to think about in terms of, um, of, of addiction more generally. Okay, thank you, panel discussant. My name is Martin. Uh, my comment or more of a question is to Ami. Uh, you spoke about uh, the harm reduction uh, strategy. Uh, I'm not sure of the population you surveyed, whether it was a general population or population of injecting drug users. If it uh, were a general population, they may not appreciate the importance of harm reduction. That is uh, especially needle and syringe uh, approach. But if it were uh, Injecting drug users, possibly the result might be different. I don't know wh what population you surveyed. Thank you. So good question. Uh, the population was a, a random sample of Virginians. Um, so not necessarily um, anyone who suffers from addiction or um, or is in recovery or anything like that. So that was my point about talking about just uh, educating the public on what the you know the three primary big benefits of a needle approach or a needle exchange approach is. So um, when you think about it differently and think about a harm reduction approach versus just a needle exchange, right, that becomes a, a more broad way to see the problem. And so um, I think that the public doesn't appreciate that, um, but I also think it's because of just a lack of awareness versus just direct opposition, like, no, we're not going to do that. I think if, um, well, first of all, if you know anything about polling, you know that you have like two seconds to get a question in. So we're really conscientious of the time that it takes, so really long questions don't always work. So, you know, the question was just support for needle exchange programs. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Okay, um, so my question is for Carl Leonard. Um, so you mentioned how that Alexalon, it's not like really, they're gonna keep coming back within like the same day. So my question is, do you think that that could also become a problem as far as being addicted to that? Addicted to naloxone? You can't be addicted to naloxone. It, it's, uh, it's just a blocker. Uh, it, there's no effect from it. It just cancels whatever opioids are in your system, which is why it's really safe to carry everywhere because if you make the wrong call and think somebody's having an overdose and, and apply naloxone and they have no heroin in their system, opioids, nothing happens. Uh, so it's a perfectly safe drug, but it's just treating one symptom. All right, thank you. So a lot of what y'all don't ever go over, sorry, this is just hard for me to talk about. Um, my mom, she's in pain management. Sorry. And, um, she, she couldn't be here because she's in so much pain, she couldn't even get up to be here this morning. And her only option is obviously prescribed medications. And y'all talk about, you don't know, like, the things that they do to monitor it. I mean, I could tell you what they do to monitor it. They make you wait till the day of to get your medications, which means if something weird happens and say the pharmacy isn't open or something, just anything weird, she can't get her pain medications, which means she instantly goes into withdrawal. She can die if she doesn't get her pain medication. 
And not only that, but she she's on two pain contracts, and if she goes to the hospital, they're not able to give her any more extra medications. Um, if they do, that breaks the contract. She's out of pain management. She has six rod, uh, six screws, four rods in her back, two blown discs, and nerve damage down her leg. And she literally lives in pain all the time. And ever since this whole thing started going, um, they reduced her pain medications to where she had to suffer severe withdrawals from. Now she's on this new stuff. It obviously isn't working because she's never been able to function normal. I actually have her on FaceTime to be here because she couldn't actually be here. But it's just, no offense to y'all, just really gets under my skin how everybody just wants to get rid of it, but everyone forgets about the people that actually need it. Well, just real quick, and, and, and your mom, her story is so common and, and blessing to see your mom for dealing with this. The problem is, yes, we overprescribe pills, so what do we do as we always do in this country? We swing the pendulum so far that cut everybody off and then we're stuck with people. But it's not overprescribed. She's done everything from like acupuncture, any- Right, no, no, I understand, but, but that's the swing where we're not really taking a critical look at case by case. And that's what we need to do. We're not saying your mom should be taken off of painkillers at all. Well, that's exactly what the government's doing, though, and that's the problem. You're, you're, you're right. That's that overswing of the pendulum, and we got to get that middle ground. And the middle ground would be yeah. like everyone's pushing right now for marijuana because everybody knows that medicinal marijuana can help with like pain management, just literally anything. And yet at the same time, they're taking away pain medications, but they're not implementing anything else, and that's what this is. Everybody's going to heroin. We've had multiple people where she's gone into the doctor's office, and she has to go once a month, every single month, to get drug tested, analyzed, make sure everything's good, whatever else. And she's been there, I don't even, I don't, she's been in this for like 14 years. And she has known people to, for the doctor to tell them, oh, we can't give you your pain meds anymore, and they would just go and kill themselves or go on to heroin. So, so this panel has tremendous compassion for your mom and for your family. And I think that what we're advocating for is the appropriate use of pain medication, and your mother is a perfect example of the appropriate use. I think that what we're concerned about is the inappropriate use, and that is not your mother's circumstance, it doesn't sound like, and so how to create more nuance in the conversation as opposed to what Sheriff Leonard is observing, which is that there's been this pendulum swing back and forth where all of a sudden there's a lot of understandable anxiety about the volume of the inappropriate use, about how many people have become inadvertently addicted as a result of inappropriate use. So for example, you know, athletes who had a temporary injury could have benefited from something like physical therapy and then could be back, you know, on their way to restoring their health because their injury was temporary. Whereas it sounds like your mom suffers from chronic pain and I'm not a clinician, but that's an appropriate use. In the same way that someone who has a terminal illness, someone who has cancer, for example, it's an appropriate use to provide, it's a, it's a, it's a appropriate and a compassionate and a moral, morally appropriate use to prescribe them pain relief and to help them manage their pain relief, however that is. So I, I just wanna draw that distinction here that this panel is observing that there is this you know, and I appreciate you sharing because it really does highlight that swinging this pendulum back to a blanket approach is actually not the appropriate. What is appropriate is to personalize these things and to look at the array of pain and recovery opportunities available on a case-by-case -case basis. The athlete who injured themselves the person in chronic pain, you know, the person who had a permanent injury as a result of their job, the person in trauma, and to figure out from the variety of different approaches that can be appropriately applied to them, what is the best one for them that both treats what they need and also reduces the risk of, of addiction in that person or in the people surrounding them. So I'll, I'll share a personal story since you have as well. One of my closest friends from college developed 
an advanced addiction to prescription pain medication that she was taking following her mother's death. Her mother died after a 14-year battle with breast cancer, and her mother was very stoic. And so her, do her doctor would say, please get your prescriptions filled to manage your pain. And there was just a, a cachet in her medicine cabinet of pain management that is appropriate for a cancer patient and that someone like my dear friend who already had an alcohol problem, she was using it to manage the trauma of her mother's death when we were in college. And that was not an appropriate use in the sense that managing her trauma might have been better done through psychotherapeutic approaches, through community, really. And so I just want to draw this I just want to draw this distinction to say that we have immense compassion for your mom um, and, and your family, and that we just want to be really clear, at least I'm, I hope I'm speaking correctly on behalf of all of us, that we want to be extraordinarily clear about the distinction between the appropriate use of a variety of therapies, including but not limited to prescription pain medication. And then I have one more thing. Sorry, I've been out here for a while, but um, in like the whole needle exchange program, I don't understand how that would do anything other than, in a sense, I get it what you mean, but say even in my mom's situation, if they took away her pain medications completely, if there was a program in order, it'd be like a rehab, but by the government kind of a thing. But anytime you say, oh yeah, if I said to anybody, oh yeah, my mom's going to rehab, they're gonna either think of like Lindsay Lohan or just some like ridiculous person when in fact it's nothing like that. So the stigma surrounding it is completely wrong and a whole needle exchange program wouldn't do anything but necessarily continue it on if you merge them two together, maybe, but it does not make any sense at all to do just that. They need therapy, they need help, they need to be mentally pushed through it, not just, here's a clean needle, you can continue kind of what you're doing, but we'll watch you and make sure you're safe. But it's not, it's a Band-Aid over the issue. Well, I think that you are right in some ways that it does have to be, um, you know, multi-pronged, that we have to address it from various perspectives. Um, and so that is what needle exchange programs do. And that's just one example of a harm reduction approach. Um, certainly there are others. Um, I understand you're concerned that, oh, you can keep using. Um, but you can also think of it as um, sort of like a, a motivational interviewing type perspective where you're kind of leading that horse to water, if you will, right? You can't really make them drink, but you can certainly present some good options to them. And so I think that we just have to recognize that um, recovery doesn't look the same for everyone and that there's different ways that folks get to recovery. And when we personalize recovery, we're gonna start seeing better outcomes. Um, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of some of the folks here in the audience because I know that they are in active recovery and what they will consistently tell you is, um, you know, you could get all of them in a room and there's gonna be various different approaches that worked for them. They're gonna talk about some of the things that, you know, might be better, might not, um, but that's what addiction looks like. It has to be personalized. So that's where you're absolutely right. That, um, again, I think that the general public is thinking sort of the same thing. Oh, you're just endorsing it, you're condoning it, you're giving them a needle, you're like, hey, go shoot up. But the truth of the matter is, is that for people who aren't um, drug seeking, um, you know, if there's a needle exchange program here on, let's say VCU's campus, if I'm on my way to Starbucks, I'm probably not likely to say, well, you know, I think I'll just go uh, over to the needle exchange program and shoot up today. I mean, that's probably not going to happen. Um, and we don't have any research that indicates that drug use increases, um, but it does make it safer for all of us. And the three areas that I happen to have mentioned with respect to uh, law enforcement, individual users with the spread, and then treatment approaches, um, those are just the three like main and imminent concerns of the Virginia Department of Health. Certainly, we heard other important issues, safety of children and park spaces and you know, safe places to go. All of it's important. But yeah, so thank you, but just make sure you all highlight that not everybody who uses 
We do know that. And today, yeah, I'm sorry if you were sitting here under the impression that we were trying to make people in chronic pain feel like addicts. That is not. They're labeled as that. Every, a lot of the people that go in there, they're like, oh, you're in pain management, so you're an addict. The doctors even treat her like complete trash because they're just like, oh, so you're just, you have to depend on your medication as in like that you're addicted to it. So just make sure. That's not. So again, what we talk about is the overprescription, and with your mother, that's not overprescription. That's what she needs to maintain, and, and we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kiana Miller. Um, so during this entire panel discussion, sorry, I'm short, so the I don't want the mic to fall. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a lot of like, we should do something, we need to do something. Uh, so my question is, who exactly is the we? And at what level will make the most effect, or at what level of government, what level of the people? Um, I'm part of a student organization here called Ada Lambda Sigma, and so we focus on homeland security and emergency preparedness. So this is a topic that some of our members will talk about, but I mean, if we're just a student organization, what exactly can we do to help? I can't necessarily answer that last question uh, because I'm not, enti not, not entirely sure of the resource campus, but I think what you've heard, and, and I'll kind of recap, like every level. I mean, this is, this is a matter for individual relationships. This is a matter for community. You know, some of the things we talked about is where are recovery places located, right? You know, we can't, we can't planners can't and, and organizations can't open a, a, a recovery place if the community says no. So one of the levels that we need to be at is advocating and saying, going to planning meetings and saying, no, I support this. Um, I support this in my community because I know how important it is. Um, and then we talk about sort of state level policy, right? We've talked about that a lot. We've talked about, I think, even federal level policy. So I think that there is a level at every, in every space to be in. Um, and I, I think Amy has some more, um, more specifics, but I think that the answer is everywhere. It is our problem and it is our responsibility. So one of the, um, I mean, a couple important places, just to be clear, um, I think businesses really need to um, be at the table here because they are employing the very people that we've had these discussions about um, from, from whatever angle. Um, and right now there is um, a stigma, you know, that check the box kind of thing where, you know, I'm a felon. And so... The good news is, is that there are businesses who um, are seeing that they have a role to play here. Churches also um, can be very active in terms of helping folks. Um, I know of a couple of churches in Chesterfield County who are working directly with uh, the sheriff's program, and they provide almost unlimited resources, it seems, for folks coming out of the programs, whether it's clothes, food, housing, paying a couple months of a light bill, providing scholarships, different things like that. So getting those people on board, getting folks in recovery in positions, have them work in, in emergency rooms to respond to folks coming out. Having these folks work in the community um, is is a, a tremendous way to start there. Um, education, right? When we put this in elementary schools, and again, I'm not, you know, there's a way that you present this information. We're not gonna have this conversation with third graders the way that we're having it here. But when we can present to them in an age appropriate way, um, we can start to make some impact. But currently, many of our schools are still afraid to talk about not only addiction, but they're also afraid to talk about healthy relationships and uh, teen abuse prevention um, and, and those other traumatic factors that can eventually be a road to using. So I, I, I see you know, when we have a room full of people like this, um, and I've been to several of these uh, the past few months because of Dreamland, but I see that people really are starting to pay attention to this because um, many polls show that people directly know someone who's either, you know, using heroin or prescription pills. Thank you. Hello. Um, this is a question for Officer Leonard. It's, oops, sorry. It's a follow-up to the first question. Um, 
I know that you said that addicts could come off the street and into your prison to get help if they need needed to, and you also said that you wanted to arrest it off the streets. So I'm thinking, why don't you merge the two? Because like the first guy who asked the question said, you are kind of still ruining people's lives by like not allowing them to have like good job prospects and things like when they come out and they're still going to turn to crime and probably to drugs for coping mechanisms. So why don't you help the people without giving them like the stigma of being a, a felon? Is there a way to meet halfway? I know I'm going to leave out here today, and tomorrow headlines are going to be Sheriff Leonard said arrest everybody. <laughs> uh, that's not my goal. My goal is to make sure that those people who need help get the help they need for their recovery. And the unfortunate fact is those resources aren't available in our community, and the only ones providing it now are our local jails. Uh, so. Uh, I wish I could get everybody to come in my jail through the front door and not the back door. When you talk about breaking the stigma, you're asking the addict, go visit the sheriff at the jail. Rather, uh, okay, but, you know how when you're driving and you get like a speeding ticket, they give you a warning, maybe they check your record, and then they see whether or not they're going to send you to court? I think it'd be more fair to do something like that, where it's like you can apprehend people? You're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and here's my, one of my greatest frustrations is officers, all law enforcement officers have, their, their number one tool is called discretion. They don't have to arrest anybody if they don't want. Now mind you, I'm a sheriff's office, I receive people get arrested. Uh, in Chesterfield we have a primary law enforcement police department and they have discretion. My greatest frustration is when an overdose victim wakes up in a hospital room and they're handcuffed to a gurney. Uh, that's the last person in my mind that should be arrested. They need to be treated. Uh, so to your point, you're, you're absolutely right, but it's not happening, uh, and quite frankly, because police on the streets don't have resources. It, you know, if, if I stop you for speeding at one in the morning and find you have heroin on you, where do I get you recovery help? Where can I take you at one o'clock in the morning? And that's the problem. If they had more resources, I think they would use more discretion against arrest and get you into recovery house. Just to add to that, I think it's also important to acknowledge that not every person who's incarcerated in his jail or any other jail for that matter, um, they didn't necessarily come in with the possession charge. We see a lot of property crime. Violent crime rates are increasing as a result of seeing these um, increases in, um, in uh, uh overdoses and, and, and everything that we've got going along. So I, I think to be fair, right, we have to understand the nature of the individual that you're working with. And so a one size fits all approach doesn't make sense. So from a shoplifting perspective, right, if you think about the number of folks that are charged with shoplifting, it's one of the number one property crimes, right? Most of addicts, they've got property theft charges on their record, whether it's going to Target to steal something because they can then sell it, they've stole their grandmother's vacuum cleaner and it's now at a pawn shop, diamond rings, whatever. Um, so the police might not arrest that particular addict as a result of having possession of heroin on them or any other drug. So I think we have to just be mindful of the, the type of person that the police are coming in contact because what I don't want is there to be this, you know, the police have created this problem. The police have not created this problem. Right? This is a problem that has been created, and all policies have um, some role, whether you may agree with that or not. It has to be a, a bigger approach. Um, so I just be mindful um, of, of that. Okay, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was gonna actually say this on the prior question, and then I thought we would just move along, but I'll, I'll say it now. How can we all get involved? We can all support a strong public sector. Yes. So Sheriff Leonard just remarked to me on the side of the importance of something like a drop-off center. So, you know, a 24-7 drop-in center. Well, that does not exist. And so the jail has become the de facto location where people go. But 
he has already experienced he doesn't want to be in the business of, of comprehensive treatment because that's not what he's trained or prepared to do. Um, but I would say in that regard that a strong public sector, and that includes everything from talk, having destigmatization conversations with our neighbors in which we say, okay, actually it's okay for a drop-in sector to go, in, a drop-in center to go in our yard, to frankly, you know, um, being comfortable with some tax increases to generate public revenue that can support these kinds of approaches that could really help to reduce the risk that the jail becomes the de facto location where people go for treatment and then have this stigma on their record. And, and so I hope that, um, that these array of approaches have shown you that, that, the, that we're not advocating that, that the jail continue to be the de facto right. location. Right. Right. You know? Thank you. Hi, uh, sorry, my voice is kind of low, but uh, but my question is for like, uh, or, or this is about like you know uh, for like the opioid the opioid use and and and, and opioid use and overdose use and everything. Why is it? I mean, uh, to make it less of a problem for for adults, why isn't there more uh, more programs in the schools and 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 uh, and 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 such like? Education, you know, you know, you know, to talk about this sort of thing, and 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 to just make it more aware about these, you know, you know, about these drugs and and, and everything, because that's what, because that's where you're really you're going to make it the most impact is 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 the schools, because you know, you know, I know a lot of people that that uh, 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 that have been addicted to just stuff like this, and they've got it, you know. And it all started in the schools. I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that most of us here th probably feel like we do need to have better education in the schools. Um, typically, we wait till like you're a senior in high school and then you might, you know, get a little something and P.S. don't drink and drive. And, um, you know, you probably should just say no um, and don't have sex. Um, but the reality is, is that parents still have a say um, in, in what their children are going to hear at schools. Um, just as an example, um, parents get to have a say in particular textbooks that kids are going to read in some jurisdictions. And if they feel like it's too of a, you know, too much of a conservative or too much of a liberal slant, then they're not going to vote that book in. And so it's really difficult to to have parents sort of say, okay, whatever message you want to tell my kids, that's okay. Um, parents don't have to let their kids hear messages that they don't want. They will send a form home that you can opt out of. So I think part of what all of us are advocating is that we um, sort of tear down those uh, walls and be more receptive to hearing about those kinds of things, um, whether we agree with them or not. Um, I think that the disagreement, like I've mentioned a couple times now, is not necessarily because we are inherently opposed to something, but really not as informed as maybe we should be about particular issues. So I would love it if we could. I was a probation officer in the juvenile court for many years, and um, I did a lot of work with domestic violence. And I mean, I could not tell you how many young girls I worked with that were um, in abusive relationships, but it's something that the schools would not talk about, right? We talked about you couldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't have sex, but we covered you are all good. Um, but we don't want to address those issues. So I, I think we're still at a place where it's easy to just sort of, like we've all mentioned in some way, that happens to other people. And when we can focus in on not a, a more of a self-centered approach, but more of a, a community-based public sector approach, then maybe we'll start to get somewhere. I just want to add that there are some schools that are addressing this. Uh, Mills Godwin High School, I believe that, that's in uh, Henrico. Henrico, yes. Uh, they had experienced some overdoses. Uh, a lot of the students were actually calling it Pills Godwin for a while, and they hosted a forum and had students and teachers and, and others talk about 
addiction, whether it was their own or family members, and and they've been trying to raise awareness at the school level there. And right. so if you think about doing that same thing in middle schools, because, um, you know, I had a 12-year-old who was shooting up heroin when I was a probation officer. So I, I think that... You know, if you do the math there, you're still in middle school when that's happening. And then you think about the years that she was just smoking pot and she was just hanging out with her friends and not coming home, right? The years that led up to that. So it's kind of late when people are dying and then you're doing something. I mean, it's great to do something. But when you're talking about primary prevention, that, that has to occur so early and um, we're not there yet because we think that children are too young to hear certain things and we want to protect them from certain things. But yet we give them cell phones where they have access to any and everything, right? So we sort of have these crazy mixed messages going on there. I don't like technology, just FYI. <laughs> um, especially for children, but they're seeing this stuff. They know this stuff. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. Hello, my name is Ron Burden. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Don't lift the mic up. Oh, my name is Ron Burden. I, I work in the field. I'm on the front line. And, and I guess my question is not just to the panel, but everyone in here. You know, I think education is the key. You know, but how do, how do we go back to the communities and change the perception of what an addict look like, should be? Because I think that stigma is what's holding the community back from accepting the programs that we do have, and I know long-term treatment works. Statistics have showed the long-term treatment works. 28 days, 30 days just don't work. So how do we convince the community that having something in your community, in your community, it won't, it won't negatively affect the community? Matter of fact, it bring a positive aspect to it. Because you got people coming out of the jails, coming out, going into treatment, that want to work. They want to blow to their stigma themselves. They want to be a part of a healthy society. So how do we convince them? to be part of that. Start talking. I mean, that sounds crazy, but I think Sarah mentioned this, that we've got to talk about it in our community. And when you are affected by addiction, I think kids, you know, I think about the kids that probably have parents who are addicts and they're sitting there in schools and they, even if they hear about this, they're like, well, it's just me, right? Um, but have, giving people the forum to actually talk about it and say, no, this is my family too. This is my community too. And I think we're hearing that. I think otherwise we wouldn't be having these NPR or New York Times or Washington Post articles that talk about, well, she was the star cheerleader and he was the, you know, head football player and suddenly they, you know, blah, 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 push comes to shove and then they become addicted. Or, you know, she was the daughter of the sheriff in Frederick County. And I mean, these are the kind of stories that happen. And I think that that's, that's starting to change. But I think you're right. I think that until we sort of are willing to talk about it, you know, it's going to be like every other addiction that we that we pushed under the rug and pretended, no, 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 it's not an alcoholism issue. It's just, you know, she likes a gin now and again, right? I mean, I think that that's that. What I think the talking piece is huge. Yeah, I agree. I think knowing someone who's, um, you know, a personal connection, like we've heard that phrase talked about several times, right? That personal connection that changes people. Um, and so, when you don't know someone who has had those experiences, it's easy to sort of point the finger at them and say they're experiencing this problem. But when it becomes a part of your family, when it or your friend group, or when you know, if you've worked in this field, you've known someone. Um, and so, I think that just the acknowledgement of it, and I think that that over time, right, is going to eventually um, give people the, the freedom, if you will, to say these things without um, worrying about what people are going to look like. And, you know, in my own life, um, my father had some issues with prescription pills. And, um, and thankfully, my husband and I were able to get him a lot of help, and he went through medical detox, had his knees replaced. But, you know, those pe the people who are on the front lines are the people that have these stories, and they're passionate about it, and they come to, um, they, they, they come out, and they want the, you know, the rest of us to hear these stories. Um, and like I said, there's people in this room who are in active recovery who are proud of those stories. Um, and you're right, it does work, but we need to talk about it. And we need to not be afraid to point the finger and say, 
my daughter, my son. We have to personalize this issue. And a lot of times we talk about, oh, we just want to be depersonalized. We don't want to get to know too much. But in a situation like this, when it is personal, you can make progress. And the reason why I asked the question is because I'm standing here today. I'm in active recovery. I have 27 years of active recovery, you know, and I've worked hard to get to this point. Bravo. And I, I, and I disclose it, and I'm also alumni here. And one of, <laughs> one of my <laughs> former students. <laughs> you know, and, 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 I, and I, when I was told about this, I, won't, I didn't want to miss it. I didn't know I could stand up and say all this, what I'm saying there. But I wanted to ask a question because it's, it's, it's really hard to change the perception of what an addict looks like. You know, people tell me all the time, well, you don't look like you ever use drugs. Okay, you just don't know. You just don't know. I mean, in, in that perception that an addict can land on the corner somewhere nodding, that is not what's happening today. That is not, no, you're not in a um, crack house. You're not in a, in, a, in a smitty, as they call it. Educate, people have education there, and they are addicted to painkillers. And then when, they, this is the other piece, is when the painkillers are gone, you can't get no prescription, then you go to the street. So it ain't just about pain prescription girl. It's about illegal, the sale of illegal drugs also. So it's something, we got to start somewhere with this. And, and the voice needs to be heard, not just from you all, but from everybody in this room. You know, we need to carry this message. We need to take the message, and we can't do it. I mean, this is great, but it takes a whole lot more than this. And it takes the, com to com the community to embrace it. And I am passionate about this, <laughs> and I think some of the people up there that know me know I am passionate about this. You know, I work with the sheriff. In, in the jail with a program, just trying to help these people. You know, I meet them when they first come in the door. I meet them on the street. People that know me in recovery, they're always coming to me around, where can we go? Nowhere for them to go. Get them clean and then you put them right back on the same place. Because communities will not accept them in their community. I mean, to me, that's an issue. That's a big issue, and we really do need to work on that. If there's anyone in the room who makes decisions about funding, right, we need it. Um, in the community for those people who are coming out of institutions, um, but also for people so that they don't have to make it through institutions. Um, so thanks, Ronald. Uh, so at the beginning of this session, we talked um, about what led us here, and we talked about big structural national things like direct marketing of prescriptions, um, how the pain label was listed as non-addictive on these drugs. Um, and I have read about uh, nations or cities outside of the United States that have been able to recover from the population that's heavily opiate addicted. Are there examples in the United States that uh, have had similar successes given those like broad national levels of like marketing and that sort of thing um, that that are still within our community as a nation in the same general laws but have been able to recover better than Virginia generally. So in Kinonis's group, he. Um I forget the name of the town, but it's the town in which the, thank you, Portsmouth, Ohio. And he does talk about the coming together of a variety of sectors. So parents who have lost their kids to addiction, um, you know, a very passionate epidemiologist. So, you know, he holds that up. And, and I, you know, it's been a couple years since this was published. Who knows if their success has maintained? Um, certainly some of the cities um, where needle exchanges have taken long-term hold have seen reductions in incidence rates around diseases, although they also tend to be um, cities that have a bit more of a, a, a compassionate tolerance for the number of people who are continuing to use um, uh, illicit drugs. So we're talking like West, like, like Pacific Northwest, right? Like Seattle, Portland, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know of any specific examples from the U.S. where um, these kind of um, synchronization of, of efforts have 
been successful in a way that Virginia can model, but I do want to call attention to something um, you just said about the global community, which is that that's actually um, a, a location or a series of locations where we where we have a responsibility, in my opinion, to turn our attention to because as um, as the pharmaceutical industry has recognized the transition in the U.S. to you know monitoring programs and everything, you know they explicitly are turning their sights on on underregulated environments globally. And if we think this is a problem now here, we're gonna be really caught off guard, uh, you know, if we don't pay attention to that in countries that have medical systems that are growing um, and that are keeping people alive longer. So for example, people who historically would have died of cancer, um, you know, at much earlier in their trajectory, it's being caught, you know, places like Kenya, for example. Um, we're going to really, it feels like a responsibility to our global community that we um, help them get out in front of it because they're going to be the next place where this is going to happen. And it, this is important to understand that this isn't just our problem. I had two gentlemen from Ghana, Africa come visit our program last week and telling us the horror stories of heroin addiction in Africa. So this it, this is global. This is global and, and everyone's fighting it. But. I'm so nervous. Sorry. Um, as a recovering addict, tomorrow's my 25-year date. Um, I had no idea that there were websites that you could go online and just order whatever you wanted. And one in particular is Silk Road. Um, they did close them down. But how many other websites such as that are there? How prevalent are they? And how would you combat it? Would you combat it from like a... Um, how they do child porn, where you've got people that are kind of coaxing people into child porn and then you catch them, and how would you combat something like that? No idea. No, this, this is the reality of this problem. Uh, we know that fentanyl and car fentanyl is being sent here from China in mass quantities through UPS, FedEx, US Mail, other sources. It's coming through our Canadian border or Mexican border. Uh, heroin's coming in at great, great amounts. That's why it's so inexpensive. Uh, so it, it's really a problem that it's going to be uh, near impossible to stop the flow. But it, it's simple business, supply and demand. If the demand goes away, the business goes away. So let's focus on it, creating a, a recovered addicts, do away with the demand for the product, and it'll go away. I don't think you can ever stop the flow because we have such easy ways to get into this country. Uh, and and we're, we're making large confiscations, uh, either on the southern border, northern border, or through the mail, but it's not having any impact, none. But Pam, just to add to that, law enforcement, are, their efforts are also geared towards those online methods. Um, so they recognize that that can be a problem, but they also see that that problem is not just with respect to drugs, but also prostitution, human trafficking, um, and another, uh, you know, a bunch of other issues um, that are all somewhat related. So um, they, they have units geared, you know, specifically to doing those kinds of things because, um, you know, the old uh, narcotics, in fact, Henrico's bunch of their narcotics guys just left. But I mean, it's not, you used to go make, you know, contact with a person and, and now it's, it's moved towards those online ways. So they're on it. Again, a lot, Almost all of us are kind of chasing our tail, though, with respect to this. Exactly. Um, thank you. Um, I currently work with Rams in Recovery, so thank you for mentioning them. They do a wonderful job here on campus. Um, but I also do some volunteer work with The Healing Place and their um, uh, program to help folks who have gone through the program, gentlemen who have gone through the program, Caritas Works, to then try to get back into the um, working world. Um, and again, we could talk a long time about how some of the convictions and some of the things on their records are impediments, and hopefully there will be um, in the future maybe opportunities to give folks who are arrested the chance to do some things so that their record could be expunged at some time, and maybe you use those types of things. But kind of a, um, 
something that goes along with that is that one of the gentlemen I've met through the Healing Place was someone who came from West Virginia who was offered a lot of pills when he was first injured in an accident. And that started him on the road to this addiction, which has been terrible. He's gone through the Healing Place, which is, I have so much admiration for the people who go through there. But in talking with him about this, his sister, who also had the same problem back in West Virginia, has gone through Suboxone treatment. He has a friend who's gone through methadone treatment, and they are on a maintenance. Um, I asked him how he felt about that, and his response was, I've gone to 20 funerals. It doesn't matter to me as long as they stay alive, mm -hmm. because at some point in time, hopefully they can move to another. So my question is, and going along with that, if our goal is to keep, keep folks alive so that they can move to the kind of treatment they need, um, how do you how do you enforce the Good Samaritan law? If there are people at a party and they have all used that some they have been using, and one of them overdoses, how do you treat the rest of the people in the room? I know that there's something on the books. I just want to understand how it's how you feel about it, how it's enforced um, in di different jurisdictions in the area. Right. So first of all, Caritas is a wonderful organization. We actually send uh, a, a lot of our addicts to the healing place. We're very excited that in the near future they're going to open up a female healing place because uh, right now it's only for men. Uh, so that's a great organization. We participate with it. We're partners with them. Um, the, the Good Samaritan law, again, is, is limited protection. Um, I will tell you I know a story of uh, a young lady who rolled over and uh, suffocated her four-day-old four baby while sleeping with her. They didn't call the police because they're more concerned with, or didn't call rescue, because they're more concerned with hiding all their stuff before the police got there. Uh, again, we talked about discretion before. If any officer, any law enforcement officer goes to a scene where somebody's overdosed, the officer doesn't have to arrest anybody in that room at all. It's discretion. Uh, I would hope that, that the initial attention would be to taking care of somebody who's overdosed or a baby who's died, and the parent wouldn't have to worry about hiding all their stuff before the police got there. Uh, but this is a cultural change uh, It's going to take a lot of changing. Uh, and there are people moving in that direction. But again, today, even without the Good Samaritan Law, officers are not obligated to make arrests. They simply don't have to. They execute discretion. Uh, and I'd hope they would understand that what's important right now is getting that overdose victim help, getting that baby help, that type of things. But, but you're right, and, and many people are more concerned about the after effects of, of will I get in trouble, and, and they're not calling. I don't know if anybody else wants. I just want to add to that really quick that um, I'm going to just use Richmond City and their response. Um, Richmond City, from what I understand, um, is not making arrests on their overdoses. Um, there may be some circumstances which require them to kind of move in that direction, but just in general, someone who overdoses, um, they're not necessarily making that arrest. I think that it's interesting that, I know it's only three, but they had three fewer deaths last year. Um, and so they are starting to see, um, you know, that maybe there is uh, an opportunity to respond differently. And we do know, I mean, one of the things that we study is the impact uh, that policies have on what outcomes are going to look like. And so when people aren't worried, then maybe we can save lives. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. My name is Michael Henry. I, uh, I guess mine is probably a, is a statement and a question, but uh, I've seen and been on both sides of the spectrum. I was a deputy in Loudoun County for 18 years. I <coughs> retired from the military in 94. I was Navy Special Forces. I, uh, I literally have I live with pain management every day. I understand what the young lady has said. I literally have hundreds of jumps. I've had both of my knees replaced. I'm waiting on a hip and a shoulder, and on top of that, I'm battling cancer. Um, my question is, is I understand about trying to educate everybody about coming together to take care of the crisis. My problem that I'm experiencing is 
you all coming together and, you know, because I literally have doctors running away because of the opioid crisis. The pain management that I'm on, I'm on a low-level narcotic, which was just classified as a narcotic two and a half years ago. I only take tramadol. I only take it twice a day. And I know at this point in my life, it's just management. And that's all I look for. I take it twice a day. It's prescribed more than that. But I've only been walking for almost three years. I was in a wheelchair for six years. I refused to go back to a cane. I refused to go back to a wheelchair. But the pain management, I mean, my pain management is getting so much to the point now where I may have to, I may not have a choice. I literally have to run water over my hands every morning just to get them to move. I'm developing cysts on my hands. And, uh, and the problem that I'm having with doctors is, is that they're so afraid of prescribing me even that low tier narcotic because they used to give me so many. Now I only get, you know, I don't know, maybe 30. And, you know, but they're, they're so afraid of prescribing it. And it's like every 90 days because of the epidemic. How do we get them to, I mean, you know, everybody needs education on the subject. How do we get to the point where they're not so afraid to be out there to, to help people? Well, there's a medical doctor like two people behind you. So um, I, I think he might have a, he might have something to say there. And, and, and the other fact, and like I said, I appreciate everybody, but the other factor that's not being represented here today is there's nobody representing on that panel, uh, you know, veterans on that panel. Correct. And I have my own issues with, um, as I mentioned earlier, my dad is a retired Marine. So the VA, um, who was super responsible for creating this fifth vital sign, this pain management, Probably and then responding that way. <laughs> yeah, my dad used to get... <laughs> pill boxes or bottles, I mean to say, mailed to him in his house mm -hmm. um, as many as he needed. So before we went into medical detox to have knee replacements, he was taking 18 Percocets and three morphines a day that oh. the VA mailed him. When he would run out, we'd just go get more. No, and I, so I, times. yeah, I mean, so no, we don't have anyone here. Um, let me just be clear about sort of what we thought about with, with respect to this panel is um, we really wanted to represent the voices of the academic disciplines in the Wilder School. And so that's, that's who we are. And so we've got the urban planning perspective and criminal justice, public administrators, and then we have a medical anthropologist to just talk about uh, the academic face, if you will, and how we can connect that to the public. So we realize that we are limited in scope as to what we're here presenting, um, but it was done in good faith. Um, and we just wanted to, you know, we wanted to be able to just speak to those of you, those of you who were interested. But yes, uh, the VA certainly, um, if you watch any news, you understand that they're going through their own issues right now. So hopefully they can get that straight. But um, yeah, I am really cognizant of the issues that uh, our disabled veterans or just veterans in general. M my brother um, is one, and so is my dad and my three uncles. Um, for those of you who know me know I come from a family of military people and then I married a cop. So, um, whose dad was a cop, so it's all he knows. But yeah, fair point. No, I prefer he married up. <laughs> so uh, my name's Hannah. I'm a junior with the Wilder School. My background's in EMS and fire. Um, I've been on both sides of things where I'm with the, the emergency team that's treating the classmate that I sat in history class with. And I also had a, uh, an immediate family member that had the 120 count. The doctor said, take when needed, popping pills like Tic Tacs. Uh, yesterday, I attended a separate panel interview um, with Dr. Abu Baker. Um, and he kind of created the thought processes or process for me, um, you know, when it came to asthma, when it came to diabetes, when it came to now HIV, we hammered those um, disease processes into the ground until 
we understood what asthma was, what diabetes was. Why has it taken us so long and why are we still so apprehensive to connect mental health, traumatic events to uh, abuse and to chronic pain use and to all of these different things that should be hammered into the ground and it just doesn't make sense to me why it's taken 50, 75 years from when we first had like mental institutions where we locked them away to now we just kind of return them back on the streets and we don't have those, those programs. I really appreciate your question and I want to talk for a moment about how research funding happens so that we can identify root causes that can, again, that can then be addressed and interventions evaluated. So um, a, a large funder of research on all of those topics that you're talking about is the federal government through NIH. And HIV is a great example of a disease that was stigmatized when it first emerged in the 80s. It was stigmatized by populations um, and, and, and research dollars were not directed to it because it was considered a humiliation for the United States and something that we should not um, care to address. And a passionate group of activists refused to be ignored and, and basically sort of forced the hand of the federal government to throw money to understand the biology, the behavior, the social and structural determinants of, of HIV infection. Um, first with the populations whom it initially um, uh, took hold in, so injecting drug users, um, you know, gay men, um, or, or men having sex with men who were not only men who identified as gay. Um, and, and then like the feminization of, of the epidemic as it spread into women uh, from mothers to children. Um, it is gonna take activists and advocates who are uh, able to and committed to having vociferous conversations like a dog on a bone, you know, with their federal representatives or their, their state representatives of the federal government to convince them the importance of pouring research dollars to understand this problem and address it. Now, this is happening. I mean, there are certainly more and more scientific opportunities to understand, ranging from the neurobiology of addiction pathways. So why is it that one person who recreationally snorts heroin at a party does not actually wind up down this road versus someone else who does, right? There's neurobiology, there's social factors, there's behavioral factors, there's all this stuff. And it really requires a comprehensive set of, of research projects um, and then an attempt to test um, interventions, some of which are the ones that make us uncomfortable, some of which are things like needle exchanges, some of which are things like talking to, so, I mean, I mentioned I have a kid. I recently had a, the first ever conversation with my kid about addiction. She's six years old. It just seemed like an appropriate moment to talk about something uncomfortable, and I, who work in public health lacked the language. And I wasn't embarrassed, but I was working my way through. I had no idea, you know, and there aren't resources for this. So I think that to your point, it just takes like literally not letting go and persistence of demanding that we conduct urgent needed research to better understand the project, uh, the problem, and then implement solutions that are, that are evidence-based. So you want to see how crazy this is, and that's a great question. 15, 16 years into this, and we're still talking. Mm -hmm. I'll take you back just a few handful of years, something happened in this country that got everybody's attention. It got federal money being sent down to the states like crazy. It got the CDC in Atlanta to issue a national emergency. All kinds of resources were thrown at it, and that was the Zika virus. And how many people died from the Zika virus? Very few. But for that response, the country went on red alert and started throwing everything at it. And I think less than five people die in this country. Here, 36,000 people die a year, and we're still talking about it. And I'm as frustrated as you are. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <clears throat>
Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Gay. I'm the medical director for the uh, sheriff's office, and Sheriff Flynn is my boss. So I got to look good for him. Are you going to beat me up too? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I want to thank everybody on the panel for bringing this uh, subject to light because it's something that needed to be done. I want to thank Dr. Raskin for uh, putting physicians in a positive light because, uh, you know, I've been getting beat up as that I'm the cause of a problem. Uh, I can tell you, I graduated from medical school, University of Florida, in 1990. I'm an internal medicine physician and subspecialized in hematology and oncology. So I used a lot of opiates uh, at the time. But I can tell you, I had maybe one hour of training on addiction through residency or even medical school. So coming out and trying to say that I'm an addiction specialist, that's non-existent. I don't know. Um, I graduated in 90. In 96, 97, 98, OxyContin was coming out. And as a resident and a fellow, I was inundated with OxyContin. I got CDs, music CDs. Uh, uh, we got the American Pain Association, the VA, JCO, which uh, helps standardize with uh, hospitals, that pain is the fifth vital sign. So everybody that came in, uh, if I didn't treat them, uh, then they would say that I was a bad doctor. And so if you want to look at that, you got to look at the doctor's perspective also. And just like Dr. Raskin said, we are benevolent. We don't want people to be in pain. I don't think if you came to me and had a broken arm and your arm was sticking out, I'm going to tell you, oh, go take some Motrin. That's not going to happen. There is a place for narcotics. And I think part of what we need to do as far as the education of everybody is to educate uh, medical students residents, fellows on addiction. There has to be a course, not just a one week, but maybe even a year like I did for anatomy. You have to have a year of addiction. And I think the medical schools are moving towards that. And I think uh, medical societies are advocating that, uh, that we have more training for the people who actually prescribe the opiates uh, to be able to get them uh, to see uh, what you need to do and to be able to uh, distinguish between the person that's trying to uh, subvert uh, the narcotics to the, to the young lady whose mom has chronic pain. Because yeah, there is a continuum. There is a continuum. And so, but we were not trained like that. So hopefully a lot of the younger folks who are in medical school, they will get that training. And later on, that this problem will hopefully abate. I'm not sure that it'll ever go away totally, but if we can get uh, more education to those who are actually prescribing, um, then that will certainly help. Even physicians who are out of training, uh, now you know, we're required to have two, uh, two hours of uh, continuing education. Every, every time you re-up, uh, renew your medical license, you have to have two hours of training. Um, so I've done my training. I've got like eight hours so far this year. Uh, I've become, since Sheriff Leonard has started our program, I've become almost an addiction specialist myself. Uh, so it is, a, it is an issue that we all have to be aware of. And there was a young lady that said, who's the we? We keep talking about we. We is you. You, all the young folks who are going to get married, maybe not married, going to get a house, live in a community, go to your board of supervisors, vote. That's how you change this. Uh, you can't keep looking at somebody else to say, what are you going to do? You have to change this. So uh, that's my spiel. The other thing is uh, being a clinician, probably the only clinician in here, we have to change the stigmata of addiction because addiction is a chronic medical condition, just like diabetes, just like hypertension. And if we in the medical community can see it that way and talk about it that way, then hopefully the stigma will come down. Because just as somebody who has diabetes, uh, they relapse. I mean, uh, heroin, any addiction, you have uh, recoveries and relapse, recovery and relapse. The same thing with, uh, with all my diabetics. I get them stable for a year or two, and then something happens, but I don't stigmatize them. I bring them back in, I re-educate, retrain, give them something new, and then hopefully that will help them. Same with the hypertension, same with asthma. Nor but, do we call that a failure, right? right. We, we don't look at someone who has a medical condition and say, well, you just failed. No, we under we need to understand that it is part of that recovery it's process. Part of the recovery, yeah. Right. So when every time somebody does relapse, you got to bring them back in, re-educate, and and continue the process. 
Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like we have two more questions, but I'm going to ask that you bring your questions to us as individuals because we're kind of being kicked out of the room. Uh, I'm so sorry, but we have gone over by a lot. So two questions. Come up here and talk to us. Saren, come on up. 